Hi, everyone. Welcome to session eight in our online course on prayer. Uh, we've kind of taken a shift, and now we're looking at some of the New Testament prayers. So if you have your Bibles, let's just jump right in. Turn to Ephesians chapter one. Uh, I want to look at two prayers found in the book of Ephesians. Um, they're separated by a different chapter. I want to give a little bit of an explanation. And so in this session and in the next session, we're going to look at the two main uh, apostolic prayers that are found in Ephesians 1. And in this session, we'll look at Ephesians 1. And in the next session, Ephesians Ephesians chapter 3. I just want to give us a, a minute of, back, of background information. Ephesians is such a profound, powerful book. Uh, I think it's worthy of your study, and you need to know that book backwards and forwards. Uh, Paul gives us so much content in that in that letter to the church at Ephesus, and it is profound and it is powerful. And one of the things that he mentions right in the first chapter, just before we get to the prayer, he talks about several different things that we have been given in the heavenly realms. He starts to he starts to map out our life in Christ as as believers connected to Christ, but he gives us another aspect of the eternal purposes of God, that which God seeks to achieve throughout all of eternity, right? There's a couple of there's a couple of places in scripture we can go to and really point to God's eternal purpose. And you and I, we need to know God's eternal purpose because it connects our personal lives in the time in which we're born with the people that we're connected to, to God's purpose for our life. He He's, his overarching eternal purposes touches our lives and comes down to the earth in our lives as it comes through Jesus Christ. And so we looked at a couple of purposes before. When we looked at John 17, we talked about oneness and we talked about mature love, that the love with which in the, in the Godhead, right, would be in our lives and that we would be one with the Godhead as they are one. That's God's eternal purposes. But here, Paul even gives us more. And he says this, I'm looking at Ephesians 1, uh, starting in verse 9. This is what he says. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. Now when God, when Paul writes the word mystery, he's not saying stop sign. No, he's saying, okay, it's a mystery, but keep coming, keep digging. Go past what seems to be the immediate barrier and boundary. Don't just take that boundary as a, as an answer, no, as a rejection, no, push past it. When Paul talks about mystery, it's actually not a stop sign, it's an invitation. Keep coming, keep digging, keep pressing, keep knocking, keep seeking, go for more. And then when he gives us the prayer, then we understand why he tells us to do this. He says, the mystery of his will. What's God's will? According to the good pleasure which he purposed in himself, that's verse 9, verse 10, watch this, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in him. God's eternal purpose is just a quick review, and then we'll go to the prayer. God's purpose throughout all of eternity is to gather everything that is the unseen heavenly realm where God dwells and the earthly realm that he created and bring them together so that they can interact with one another and relate to one another through the person of Jesus Christ. There is no one else that can bridge these two realms like Jesus does. There is no one else that can connect us. And this is God's eternal purpose that we would be connected to him, that we would be in relationship with him, that his eternal purpose, we would know him through the person, through the person of Jesus Christ, that we would be one with him, John 17, 20, that we would have a love that is deep like unto his love, that's John 17, 26. These are God's eternal purposes. This is what he's seeking to achieve. My friends, if you can receive it, this is what God is wanting to do in your life. That's what he's wanting to do in your life. That's all he's trying to attempt to do. Bring you into deeper relationship with himself. Greater oneness, greater love through the person of Jesus Christ. And he's doing this not just with you individually. He's doing this with the world. And he gets resistance from the world. That's called warfare, right? 
and he gets acceptance from those who receive it from him. There's always seems to be a smaller number that does that, but this is his eternal purpose. So let's go to the prayer. So because of this purpose, Paul calls us to pray. And this is what he calls us to pray, starting in verse 15. Therefore, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Watch this. That. Keep an eye on those different, those different phrases, that, that word, that. It's a transition phrase through different sentences or different phrases of this prayer. You can actually isolate easily the phrases of this prayer many times because, not every time, but many times because each phrase begins with the word that, right? And so it's isolating a new phrase for us, just so you know when we get to it later. That, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait, stop, time out. Jesus always said he's my father. Paul is saying he was his God. Jesus had a God. It's his father. Wow. The Father of glory may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ, in the knowledge of him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you would know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him his right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age that is to come. Wow, what a prayer. Let's just stop for a minute. Let's isolate a few of these phrases that begin with that that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, have you ever considered that Jesus, when he bowed in prayer before his Father, he, he told us to pray, our Father. Yes, I recognize he connected. He connected us to his Father. But Paul is telling us here that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus did not just bow before his Father on the earth, and looked to him as his father alone. He looked to him as his God, the one he worshipped. Oh, my friends, have you ever considered that? That Jesus worshipped his father as God. As you and I would worship Jesus as our God, Jesus worshipped his father as his God. Jesus had a God. I don't know if you've ever thought of that before, but Paul is clearly saying the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next, the Father of glory may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Spirit of wisdom and revelation. In other words, God cannot be discerned by human flesh. The only way we can interact with God is through that spirit of wisdom and revelation. If he reveals himself to us, which he longs to do, he loves to do, God God through his Holy Spirit, this is the thing he loves to do the most and is just to use a human expression, he's just dying to do it. He just wants to, he wants to reveal, he wants to reveal God to you and I. He says that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. In other words, that that spirit of revelation would turn on the lights. Paul, I believe, is specifically referring us back to that moment where on the road to Damascus, when a light shone from heaven, it blinded him for a few days. And after he had hands laid upon him and the scales fell off his eyes and he saw God. I mean, he saw God in a completely different way. In other words, the, the light of revelation that touched Paul's eyes, it was not just his physical eyes, my friends. He was speaking, he was seek, speaking of the eyes of his spirit. The, the spirit would, would actually see God and worship God in, in a new way. What is it that he wants us to see? Three things. The hope of his calling. In other words, what hope comes to us through what Jesus is called to do. Now, there are so many things that Jesus is called to do, but the ones that you and I connect to the most, John the Baptist said in John's gospel, first chapter, two times, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In other words, what's, 
What's the hope of Jesus' calling? Is that he will remove all of the injustices of the earth. He will remove them as he comes as he comes to lead the earth. The hope of his calling as Messiah to rule and reign from Jerusalem, not just in the clouds, but on the earth, truly from the throne of his father David. Oh, my friends, there's different, so many different aspects that we are, that what truly gives us hope is the calling of Jesus Christ that he is accepted to walk out, that he's been given by his father. Next, he says that we would know the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints. My friends, we are Christ's inheritance and he sees it as a good thing. He's received us from his father as his inheritance and he's happy. He's happy that he gets us. That should humble you and I. That should call us to our knees in thankfulness and worship. It should drive sin from our lives because we're his inheritance and why would he want me? Look at my life. I mean, if he if he could truly see what I did last night, oh my God, you know, it's like, and no, he's, he's saying, no, I, I take you. Now let's change your life. Transform your life. He says, I, I take you as my inheritance. And then third, the exceeding greatness of his power for thus for those who believe. In other words, that we would touch the power of God that same power, that word there is dunamis, that same power that was used to raise him from the dead. He wants us to experience this power in our lives, that we be power empowered internally in our hearts by the grace of God, and that our works, our hands would be empowered, that what we would do would have power on our hands. These are the things he wants us to know. My friends, this is a prayer that you and I should be praying. Oh, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened that our eyes would be opened, our spiritual eyes would see God in all of his beauty. Oh, my friends, this is a prayer we want to pray. This is a prayer we want to pray for our families. This is a great prayer of the Bible. Let's dig deep into it. The Lord bless you. See you in the next session. Bye-bye.